Welcome to Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership, the weekly podcast that features the very best in career development in the nonprofit sector. I'm your host, Pat McDowell, and in addition to podcasting, I'm a leadership coach, a mastermind facilitator, a best selling author, and a speaker. I love taking these nonprofit leadership topics on the road or into your Zoom room. So if you need somebody at your next conference or workshop, check out my new speaking page at patentmcdowell.com for more information. Well, I know you're going to enjoy this fantastic conversation with Robert Touchstone, who is a wonderful ambassador for National Philanthropy Day. And yes, this episode is being released on National Philanthropy Day in Charlotte, at least. And it has become an annual episode for the Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership podcast because it's our attempt not only to lift up wonderful examples of philanthropy in this community, but also to lift up these ideas because they apply to your community wherever you are listening to this episode. Now, in addition to our discussion around National Philanthropy Day, Robert's got some great advice to offer. He has an impressive leadership journey. And he offers suggestions that helped him, one, get started on his path to nonprofit leadership, what helped him advance and build a career, and then what has helped him succeed in his current role as Vice President of Philanthropy at the Arts and Science Council here in Charlotte. And, of course, he does a masterful job of illustrating the impact of three particular award winners in this year's NPD uh, celebration in Charlotte. But again, how these opportunities will provide ideas for you. How do you celebrate National Philanthropy Day? How do you celebrate philanthropy in general through your organization and in your community? You'll have some ideas after you listen to this episode. Well, don't forget to check out the show notes for this episode. It's number 183. Just go to the new podcast page at patentmcdowell.com and you'll find all of the resources mentioned as well as more information on Robert and the great work he's doing both at ASC and through AFP Charlotte. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Robert Touchstone. Robert, thank you for joining me on the path. Thank you for having me, Patton. Well, I'm excited about this conversation, Robert. You've had a fantastic career in nonprofit leadership in different sectors. Uh, and you've also uh, established yourself as a leader here in the Charlotte community through AFP and other ventures. So I want to unpack that, especially because in your role as AFP president, as this episode is being released, it is National Philanthropy Day. And so you and I are going to talk about that. And you've got some great ideas about how nonprofit leaders, frankly, might continue to uh, leverage, I I guess, some of the things that National Philanthropy Day represents. So we'll get to that. uh, But first, let's start with that question. What is National Philanthropy Day, Robert, for those listeners who maybe aren't familiar? Well, I'll try and keep it really simple, but at its heart, National Philanthropy Day is a celebration of the charitable work everyone is doing to make a difference in their own community. Um, It's celebrated across North America, and we have more than 130 AFP chapters across North America that hold events and activities every year. Uh, I think it's significant because it's a very simple way to uplift all of the different forms of giving back um, that we have here in our in our communities. And it's also a great way for us to come together, share stories of the great work being done and just enjoy a nice, simple meal together and chat and connect with others. Yeah, I have uh, been fortunate to experience here in Charlotte on multiple occasions, and I'm guessing many of our listeners are at least familiar with National Philanthropy Day, if it is indeed in their community, and or maybe it's something they can start in their communities, right, if it's not currently uh, taking place. And we're going to unpack it, not just to celebrate some of the award winners here in Charlotte that, frankly, are representative of uh, great philanthropy in every community, But let me first ask you this question, you know, Robert, let's talk about you and your journey. You know, what led (laughs) you to the work in nonprofit leadership? Where, how did you start? Well, it's always a funny question to get asked because I I always have to say that I kind of fell into it. And I feel like that's something that a lot of us say. Um, But out of college, I really saw myself working in marketing um, with a Fortune 500 uh, company. That, That was my goal coming out of uh, my master's of business administration uh, courses. (laughs) But frankly, that was not meant to be my journey, I don't think. Um, 
I moved from my college town to the big city of Atlanta and never quite found that job. Um, so I fell into working in hospitality and tourism, which was a, an industry that I knew uh, because I worked through college and that's where I spent my time. Um, but, you know, that was a great learning experience because if you've ever worked in hospitality, you know, it's all about customer service. It's right. all about listening to people. And it gives you some really good, good um, fodder for working in nonprofits. Um, when I left Atlanta, I actually came to Charlotte um, because I was burnt out and I was looking to do something more meaningful with my life other than working, you know, in a restaurant, running a restaurant. So um, I actually went to work for a startup company here in Charlotte that ultimately failed. But it was a really good learning experience because I was um, helping them with their website management, marketing their product. And so I was able to get some really good experience that would help me later in my career. Um, what I didn't expect when I moved here was to stumble upon this really amazing local theater company called Actors Theater of Charlotte that I just absolutely fell in love with. Right. Uh, I love adult contemporary theater. They do that. Well, they did that. Their last production was actually uh, ended last week, which is a sad and it's sad. Um, to see them. Yeah. Um, but really, I just fell in love with their work and I always have had a love for theater. So I just continued to, to stay, you know, check them out, see what was going on. And then lo and behold, one day they're hiring for a, a director of marketing and development. So I said, why the heck not? You're not happy with the work <laughs> that you're doing. Right. Why not jump into nonprofits? You've got the marketing experience. And then I thought about it and I was like, wait, you have the fundraising experience too. Um, I went to Millsaps College in Jackson, Mississippi, and I just happened to be the top student fundraiser for the um, annual fund of uh, student fundraising program for both my freshman and sophomore years. Wow. So I figured I could parlay that into a job. Good for you. <laughs> and, and in fact, well, it, and so you you kind of tied together those skills, even if you hadn't explicitly thought about being a, a fundraiser, you actually did have both from a corporate and from your student days experience that allowed you to kind of hit the ground running. Yeah, absolutely. And I was really fortunate that Actors Theater took a chance on me. Um, you know, I I spent six years of my my career, my early career, cutting my teeth and all of the aspects of nonprofit work. And it was really you know, fortunate that Dan Shoemaker, um, you know, their founding executive director took me in and said, hey, you know, I'll give you a shot. You've got some experience, but you obviously haven't worked in nonprofits. Right. Um, and he really took me by the hand and showed me everything from volunteer management to, um, you know, balancing the checkbook to budgeting, um, writing appeals, because that's something that he had done for the organization, and then doing the grants for the, um, to ASC and some other funders. So, it was a really good uh, chance for me to, you know, get to cut my teeth in nonprofit yep. Work yep. And, and get a get a really wide ranging, uh, wide range of experience um, in, in the nonprofit sector. You know, it, it, it suggests to me that finding an early mentor, or you were fortunate to have both a good boss who was <laughs> a mentor. Is that fair or what what was key Absolutely. to your early success? Absolutely. Mentorship has played a tremendous role. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Dan. And I have to lift, lift up one other person Sure. Um, because while I was at Actors Theater, I actually had a board member who took an interest in me. Um, she was a professional fundraiser and she was also on the board of AFP Charlotte. And she really challenged me to take the profession seriously, learn it. She pushed me to get involved at the chapter and really made sure that I you know, went through, did continuing education and got all the skills that I needed to become a good steward and, and, and learn about major gifts and then also become an effective leader. And I, so I'm going to say kudos to Marjorie Bray if she's listening, because she's <laughs> definitely the person who really uh, stuck it to me and got me where I am today. Well, I, I, I know and like Marjorie as well. So kudos to her and, and kudos to you, frankly, Robert, for embracing the kind of support was there because not everybody, frankly, takes advantage of those mentors that maybe are, in fact, around them. You did. You advanced uh, successfully there and, and continued in your fundraising career, right, in terms of a couple other organizations that led you to your current role at ASC. Yeah, and and I was fortunate again <laughs> to, for somebody to take a little chance on me. Um, you know, notably Jim Warren at the at Carolina Raptor Center. You know, that was my second job in nonprofit fundraising, and he saw the work that I had done at, at Actors Theater and said, "Hey, I'm going to take a chance on you and bring you in to help us get through our first ever capital campaign," which was a tremendous experience. Wow. 
And and but a, a different sector. How, how was that transitioning from an arts based organization to I, I guess we'd call it environmental at the Raptor Center? Yeah, environmental, conservation, science, you know, STEM. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate to have worked, you know, uh, with an actor's theater and, and at the Raptor Center. They are connected um, by an organization called the Arts and Science Council. And that's kind of how I knew. Uh, I knew Jim and the folks at the Raptor Center, um, you know, prior to getting a, a, you know, a master, an MBA and, and graduating with my ultimate undergraduate degree in Spanish. Um, I was pre-med. <laughs> And not a lot of people know that. So I have a tremendous love of science. Right. Uh, most people know my connection to performing arts and arts in general, but they don't necessarily know that I have a huge history with science and spent a lot of time in labs and know that, you know, science education is really important for the overall development of any student. So when I saw the job at the Raptor Center, I got very excited. <laughs> Um, I, I love Jim, you know, as a, as a human being, but I also love the work that they did using birds to spread a, mes a message of conservation and to really inspire young students to learn about science. That makes total sense. And I'm glad you elaborate on that because you're right. I would have at first thought that that's a, an interesting shift <laughs> in, in your career trajectory, but it absolutely makes sense now. And of course, so sad, you and I both are fans that we lost Jim this past year. He was yeah. a guest on this podcast, so I want to lift that up to our listeners uh, if they want to check that out, because he was an, a wonderful leader for both of us in this uh, in this community. But again, good for you. You took advantage of these wonderful mentors on your career. And then let's talk about what led you now to your current role. <laughs> Gosh, it seems kind of kind of like an, an accident, but... You know, it's not really because the Arts and Science Council was always my top funder. So it's obviously an organization that I had, you know, a very deep relationship with, both in my roles at Actors Theater and Carolina Raptor Center. Right. So I knew them extremely well, respected their work. And the reason why I went there was honestly, after going through a capital campaign, even even a modest one like the Raptor Center's. I was a little burnt out and yeah, I yeah. was looking for that next step because I, you know, I told Jim when I was going there that, yes, I'm here to get you through a campaign and then we'll see what happens. Right. Um, but, you know, at that point I was like, you know, I need to slow down a little bit and kind of just take a little bit of a breather and look for jobs that will give me a little bit of space to develop as a leader, but also, lean into a team because I didn't have a very large team at the Raptor Center. And I was very fortunate that ASC leadership had just reached out to me knowing that we had completed a campaign and expressed some interest in me taking over, um, you know, their, their position as vice president of philanthropy to help stabilize the ASC ship um, while we were seeking a dedicated tax revenue to fund the entire cultural sector. Um, wow. And if you don't, if yeah. you don't know the work of ASC, you know, we're, we're a United Arts Fund and we fundraise much like the United Way um, through workplace campaigns. That was a very, you know, very much a failing business for us. Yeah. And we were seeking other streams of revenue to right the ship and really get the funding that the sector needed. So, you know, they expressed to me, we need somebody who can come in here, stabilize what we've got, make sure we're not you know, losing a ton of money at, while we figure out what we're doing over the next couple of years. And to me, that sounded like a very attractive, uh, you know, uh, venture because it was an opportunity to help an organization I really love and believe in. I knew their fundraising team and had tremendous respect for them. And I knew that I already had ideas of how that we could implement very easily over the course of that two to three year transition period that could really help us, you know, bridge the gap until we were went from a, you know, public private investment organization to one that's primarily funded by the government well, so you know it's it's one of those things it's you take a job um you know i i knew that i'd likely be working myself out of a job by taking this job sure sure but i was really comfortable with that because it afforded me the time to really slow down and do some work for the sector that i know and love well and as someone who had experienced the, the intensity of a capital campaign uh, I'm guessing, Robert, you really didn't get to slow down completely, given the intensity and all that you've done for ASC. Is that fair? <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's funny. You, you think you're going to do you're going to do one thing and you end up doing a completely other thing. Right. Um, 
you know, the, the political winds have shifted here. That referendum campaign uh, did not pass. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, the job that I am doing now is very different from what I thought it was would be. Um, it's not just about, you know, stabilizing what the existing business of ASC, it's actually about building a completely new business for ASC, one that I actually love and am really excited to work on. Um, because I mentioned workplace giving is, is not working for us. You right. know, we're an inflection point as an organization and we're ripping that bandaid off and we're really focusing on how we can be a real fundraising organization that leverages meaningful relationships with its donors to fund the work that we want to do in the community. So it's this very fascinating place to be in in your career where you come into a, you you come to take a job for one reason and you end up doing the exact opposite and having to you're getting to do this really amazing work that you never thought you'd be able to do. Yeah, I love that. And and you you anticipated the question I was going to ask you. In other words, you arrived at a, kind of the Federated Arts campaign kind of model, but mm -hmm. it, it now is is it more driven by individual and family philanthropy or how how would you describe this shift literally in terms of the kind of fundraising work you're doing now? Well, so we're we're still we are still, you know, reliant on workplace giving, um but we're only doing it in the places where it makes sense for us and where there is the potential for us to really have good interaction with the employees within that campaign. Right. So when I started working at ASC, we had about 45 workplace campaigns, which was down from our all time high of 300. And this year we've cut that back to six campaigns that we will wow. actually run. Wow. Um, because we think, you know, yes, these six campaigns provide us the best return on our investment from staff perspective. Um, and can continue to create enough enough revenue for us to to really look at the rest of the business and focus on ways to improve that. So you know, this year we're we're rolling out new ways of talking to our individual donors, our corporate donors. Um, we're doing more project based um, fundraising for specific grant making initiatives. And we're doing something that we haven't been able to ever tell our donors. It's like, this is actually what we're going to do with your money. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is how we're going to invest it. And this is how we're going to report back to you on it, which is basic in its most, <laughs> at its most, uh, you know, it's basic at, 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 at its fun, at, at a fundamental level, level, but for us, it's revolutionary. It's, it's very different. Yeah, because and, and, we've never been able to do that. We were, you know, we were this large amalgamator of funds that put it out to, you know, a number of organizations, and it was very hard to report on that type of impact. I, well, I'm impressed, and you're right, though it is a somewhat dramatic shift from the historical model that that can't federated campaigns like you and other United Way organizations have had to, frankly, I think, struggle with. And and I, I was going to ask you as you talk to peers around the country. Uh, do you think that's where everyone is moving or how would you describe kind of the trends around organizations like yours? Well, so there are a number of United Arts funds um, that operate in in uh, you know, the United States that are actually do, still doing relatively well. Okay. Um, they haven't seen the dramatic shift in workplace like we've seen. We were at the very front end of that head that headwind um, right. nationally because we were the largest United Arts Fund in the country. Um, but you know, as our workplace landscape has shifted here in Charlotte, you know, we've become less regional, more national, more global focused in the companies that we have here and the companies that we attract. Um, local philanthropy is, is being, you know, it can be hit harder in that type of an environment. Um, there, there are, you know, the cities where they're having success still have very entrenched, you know, fill or uh, corporate corporate uh, citizens that right. don't want to necessarily <laughs> globalize their investments in, in in nonprofits. They're more focused on investing in their home community, and you know, here in Charlotte, it's wonderful when a company offers its employees the ability to invest in any nonprofit that they want to across the globe but it also has an impact on the local organizations where you know 10 years ago your only options were the united way and the, and the asc yeah and so you've given your donors more options and obviously they're going to choose things that align better with their interests and values but it sounds like again you have been responsive here in charlotte 
in terms of being even more specific in in essence allowing donors to if not designate to feel a, a more specific connection to where their money's going is that kind of the new the new twist if you will yeah absolutely so the way that we're looking at it is we've divi we've divided our business into three strategic investment priorities um, around community programming, creative individuals, and this area that we still toy around with the name on, but we're calling it leadership development. Okay. Um, and so we're we're messaging those three strategic priorities and the grant um, the grant investments that we give within those priorities directly to the donor. And we're fortunate to have such good partnership with our you know our local and state governments. Um, that we know how much money we're getting from them, and we've been able to anticipate what the need for the community is based on our historic grant making. And so we're able to look at what we've got from a pub, you know, public dollar perspective, and say, "Wow, oh, here's the the actual gap for what we want to uh, that what we want to invest in the next three to six months." And we're going to talk about that to our individual donors and to our corporate donors, and. Literally, this we're in the first couple of months of doing this, and so we don't know if it's going to work well. But I am very hopeful because it feels like we're doing everything right. Yeah, that well, it sounds impressive, and of course, I'll be eager to hear uh, as the time passes what kind of reaction you get. But I've got to believe you're uh, optimistic, or I can understand why you're cautiously optimistic that the response will be positive. And of course, you continue to do great work in this community along those three kind of pillars of programming that you described. Um, well, let me shift gears a bit, Robert. In, in addition to all that you're doing at ASC, I, I guess you you couldn't let your mentor and friend Marjorie Bray down and not get involved in AFP. And in fact, you've not only gotten involved, you're now leading the local AFP chapter. So talk about that leadership role that you've had and what you have been focused on as current president of our local chapter. Well, and and I mean the the role of president is a is a pretty you know interesting one at AFP Charlotte because you know you obviously work up to it, um, and this is my seventh year of service on that board, and I've chaired programming, I've been the head of programming, I've also been chapter uh, treasurer, um, among other roles, and you know basically the president is the person who's just who's sitting up sitting there and saying hey we're going to do x this year during my presidency and here's how we all come together to achieve that goal i've been very fortunate to be you know to have been preceded by a number of very strong presidents here at afp charlotte and in particular over the last couple of years we've been really focused on um, afp's idea initiative which is inclusion diversity equity and access um, so we've been building on that over the last couple of years, and this year I really saw it as my role for us to continue that conversation, but look at it kind of in a different lens, um, because there are a number of shifts that are happening in our profession. <laughs> um, you know, we've had this, this best practice of donor-centered fundraising for, what, 20-plus years right, now? Right, right, right. And there's all of this new new research data and conversation around community centric fundraising, and it's something that is very interesting when you when you talk to different fundraisers, um, you know, here locally. Some people think it's a great a great new new change to what we're doing, a great way to enhance our work. Um, a lot of pe many people don't even know what, what what community centric fundraising is, and then those that do know what they both are, they're like, no, no, this is really the best way to do it. Yeah. Um, so as a board, we just started having conversations about, well, hey, how do we do the best by our members and to kind of introduce this new fundraising concept that's really not all that new, but it's definitely more mainstreamed. And how do we create a conversation here locally of how we might improve as fundraisers, either with donor-centric fundraising or community-centric fundraising? And so we've been, um, you know, fortunate to have a couple of nat you know national speakers and local speakers come in and really talk about what you know each of those are, what does it mean, how do you do it, and what are some of the common misconceptions? And so for me, it's really just about giving the membership, you know, our membership and our you know fundraising community here the access to really amazing programming that they can learn something and go back to their jobs and say, hey, I learned this, let's try it. That's perfect. And again, I, I love that you're raising some of the topics, sometimes complex topics within our world of philanthropy, as you said, the donor centric versus community centric philanthropy and fundraising. So that to me is evidence of what my next question is around, which is you know, the value of joining your local AFP chapter. 
So, you know, Robert, again, why'd you join? And for someone listening who's like, wow, I'm really busy <laughs> at my organization, <laughs> uh, fundraising or whatever I do, why would you tell them to also join AFP? Well, and, and I mean, this goes back to, you know, some of the previous points around good mentorship, but, you know, I joined because somebody held my hand and said, this is something you need to do. Do you believe in being the best at whatever profession you choose? My answer is always absolutely. Do you believe that every profession has a set of best practices? Yes, it should. Um, do you want to learn more about that? Do you want to get continually better at your job? Absolutely. Those are all reasons why I choose to join a AFP and AFP Charlotte, because it provides me those opportunities. And it does it right here in my community. So I don't have to necessarily go anywhere to get really good <laughs> educational sessions, conversations around different topics of philanthropy, whether it's ethics, developing an annual fund campaign, a capital campaign, planned giving, you name it, we've got it. And we're bringing speakers to you that work in this community, but also speak nationally. And we provide you a lot of value for that membership um, because, you know, we deserve that as fundraisers. We're, we're a legitimate profession. And I think everybody who, you know, is, is a professional deserves the best access to continuing education. Yep. Articulated beautifully. You have certainly done more than your share. Seven years, <laughs> did I hear? And and does will there be an eighth as a past president, Robert? Is that the final step on your, I guess, as far as you know right now? Well, yes. So I am obligated to an eighth year as past president, but <laughs> not not to not to be you know a straggler or anything like that. Um, you know, I did say, oh well, you know, we do have a gap at treasurer, so I guess I can also stay on exec and be treasurer next oh, year. Wow. So. <laughs> You are a glutton for punishment, my friend. Oh, treasurer is one of the best jobs because the numbers <laughs> don't lie. It's really easy. <laughs> well, again, I hope our listeners will consider uh, at first your your uh, advice simply to get involved in the profession, whatever it is, certainly as fundraisers, uh, other nonprofit leaders listening perhaps will have other means for professional development and national association. But uh, thank you for being such a good advocate for AFP and an advocate for this signature program that we're about to talk about, National Philanthropy Day. And again, I'm encouraging our listeners, while they're going to hear wonderful stories in the community you and I live, but I think there's takeaways, if you will, in relevance to these topics and categories of award winners that apply to every community. And so I know you're going to help me make that exact point. So here in Charlotte, uh, I know we give away eight different or we recognize eight different awards, but let's talk about a couple of them, Robert, that have been meaningful to you and maybe will help illustrate some of our points. The first one, Outstanding Philanthropist, you know, one of the signature awards, I would say, within this Absolutely. ceremony. But talk about AFP Charlotte's recognition of the Outstanding Philanthropist and kind of what it meant to you. Yeah, well, so this award honors an individual or a family um, for exceptional generosity demonstrated either through uh, civic responsibility and leadership, community involvement, personally meaningful financial contributions to charitable organizations, um, and overall just having a positive impact on the Charlotte Mecklenburg region. So, you know, it's a really important award. I think where people get you know caught up on this one is it, it doesn't necessarily mean they give a lot of money right, it means that they're right. really really in, dedicated to having a positive impact on our region and so that's where you know i find the most meaning in this award well and it sounds like this year's winner in that category represents exactly <laughs> that they've been generous in more ways than just financial right absolutely so this year's um winners are joe and carol uh, geigler and they were nominated by Crisis Assistance Ministry, which is a fabulous nonprofit. If you have not heard of them, I know um, they would love to get to know you. <laughs> but um, the reason why they nominated um, Joe and Carol is because they've had decades of long service, whether that's in health and human services, education, performing arts, and also faith-based organizations. They just had a tremendous impact. Um, but what really struck me is the really amazing part of their story with crisis assistance is that their engagement came from volunteerism, specifically the volunteerism of their daughter, who was there partaking in one of their programs. 
And their daughter loved that, loved the organization so much that she said, mom, dad, you have to come back. You have to tour this organization and you have to learn more about them. <laughs> and that relationship has been what, 15 years in the making. And I guess about five years into it, uh, Joe joined their board of directors. He ultimately chaired it during the COVID-19 pandemic. And he's just a really good example of philanthropy, in my opinion. Yes, they give generously of their, their treasure, but this is a guy who's you know done with his board leadership service and he still writes thank you notes to donors. Wow. And he still writes letters to other leaders in this community saying, you need to learn more about this organization and support it. To me, that's just the, the epitome of a good natured, good person. And we need more people like that in our community. Yeah, what a beautiful illustration of everything you said. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about a takeaway for a, a nonprofit leader listening. Number one, kudos to Crisis and the other organizations that have worked with them. But I guess, it, Robert, what is your takeaway? One, Mine might be taking care of your volunteers, or, or do you have a path for volunteer engagement, right? I mean, that was literally the path that got this family involved in, in a very meaningful way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think your your point is right on the nose, and this is something that I struggle with because there's not a lot of volunteer opportunities within my organization. So it really challenges me to think about how do you make a, a meaningful volunteer experience so that you can connect with somebody in the community, they can help share your story, and ultimately bring more people into your flock. Right, what a neat also example about getting a whole family involved, right? I, I wonder sometimes we we target maybe a single individual not realizing that there are other family members that may well get involved. And, and in this case, right, the daughter said, hey, mom and dad, we need you here. And it, it really did make a difference. Yeah, I mean, I, I won't I will, I will spoil too much of their, their award ceremony, but the, the way that they got involved in a, as major donors to crisis assistance ministry is actually quite fascinating and it's something that made the news um but we'll just say that they're they're really big um pittsburgh steelers fans and they're pittsburghers and right. they they may or may not have opted out of going to a super bowl to donate the money that they were going to spend on that trip to a nonprofit, and then shared that story with others in the community saying i challenge you to do the same thing oh my goodness wow yeah <laughs> that that is a level that is absolutely uh, award worthy <laughs> uh, so it certainly reinforces why they are wonderful. And again, I would encourage our listeners to think about who are those families that are most meaningful to your organization now? And are you creating opportunities to get others involved? And so clearly uh, they represent exactly that. Um, well, let's move to another category, Robert. I know it's been meaningful to you and the Champion of Diversity Award. Talk about what that is and then kind of how this year's recipients represent it, what it stands for. Yes. So uh, again, this award recognizes an individual or a family, um, but it's looking for the someone or some some bodies <laughs> that have demonstrated leadership and promoted diversity in philanthropic activities that create community impact and engagement. It, it seems to me uh, this is a great example where philanthropy allows a donor to truly make a difference in something that's important to them personally. And so it, it sounds like, would, Robert, would you agree their story is one that they recognize the need and then turn their philanthropy as well as their community engagement as, a, as an answer, really, to a question they felt needed attention? Yeah, I think that that is a perfect summation of what this award is intended to recognize. Well, I'm just glad, again, and, and I hope, I guess, are there takeaways in your opinion as to what the Champions of Diversity, you know, while AFP has a wonderful and formal ceremony in many communities around this, there's no reason you as a nonprofit leader can't recognize these categories individually, right? I mean, absolutely. And, and so I wonder if every nonprofit leader listening said, all right, who's a champion of diversity at your organization in your community that maybe you just recognize at your annual banquet or annual dinner or whatever. Um, but that, is certainly something you've lifted up right through this ceremony and this category in particular. Yeah, I mean, I think anybody can do this in, in any format that they want. And I, I think, you know, this year's recipients of our award, um, Todd and Janelle Collins, are, are really amazing examples of this type of work. 
um, and mainly because they've thought about a community issue um, that you know most of us are aware of, and I can talk a little bit more about it, but they've thought about it a way to address it that is a really interesting <laughs> way to come at it, something that we might not think of as traditional fundraisers or even community members. But yeah, maybe share that example, because you're right. I think that is significant, not just as a fundraising story, but it, again, represents how we engage uh, philanthropists in our communities uh, around an issue. And that's exactly what they did, right? Right. Well, and, and uh, you know, many who are listening in, in Charlotte and Mecklenburg County and the surrounding region know of our friends at Atrium Health and their um, Giving Hope uh, campaign that they're in the middle of. And Todd and Janelle Collins are um, donors to this. Todd is also a board member um, of, of the foundation. But um, they have seen issues in this community, and, and I know it's happening in other communities, around um, you know, disparate health outcomes for patients of color. Right. Um, and you know, we know this is an issue, and we know it can sometimes be the fault of the, you know, the caregiver because they just don't understand where the patient is coming from and also don't know how to necessarily identify some of the key markers that would, would say that this patient is in real need of help. Um, and so, you know, the the I would say the traditional way to come come at that is to continue to engage in educating your healthcare providers that are existing and you know in the community on these issues and really trying to get them to see the need. But the Collinses really thought about this differently, and they decided to establish a scholarship program at Carolina's uh, College of Health Sciences within their nurse aid program to increase the diversity of the student body. So and by in, so in turn, helping to increase diversity of actual people administering care and do that in a way that removes the barrier to access for students who are wanting to get started in the healthcare field. Um, and that was a fascinating thing for me to see, because that's not something I would have thought of as a fundraiser. Right. It, right. You know, that that to me is a, a very creative way to come at a, an issue and really make health care outcomes, you know, more equitable for patients of color um, by putting people in the room that look like them and can help, you know, help them as a patient get the care that they deserve. Yeah, love that story for many reasons. Strategic philanthropy at its finest. Uh, in essence, the, the donors use their own strategic thinking to go upstream, right? And Absolutely. think about how this issue might be addressed sooner in the process. And thus, it's really a win-win for healthcare, particularly uh, in communities of color. So glad AFP Charlotte is lifting these folks up for that exact reason. Uh, and, and again, it's why all these categories, uh, you know, give us such a positive feeling. Um, a, a, a third and final category, Robert, that I know you and I both <laughs> share enthusiasm for, frankly, is the emerging leaders, the next generation of philanthropists. So talk about that category. I think it's labeled the, the student fundraiser, outstanding student fundraiser, or how is that described? Yes, so it is the Outstanding Student Fundraiser, and it recognizes um, a student or a group of students whose um, volunteer uh, fundraising efforts have made an impact on a local nonprofit. Um, so it's a really cool award that's helping, you know, recognize the efforts of young people in the community who are really just trying to make a positive difference. Well, and you have, in fact, a wonderful <laughs> example of exactly yes. that. So tell our listeners about this, because I think you you mentioned to me earlier that often we think college students uh, begin to uh, have ideas about philanthropy, but you found someone even younger than that. Yeah, generally our, our award winners in this category are college students, but this year we have a very impressive high school senior um, named Lexia Giannopoulos. Um, she is a senior at Community School of Davidson, and she was nominated um, by a local nonprofit called New Gen Peace Builders, and they have been really impressed with her because uh, she helped them develop a pilot mentorship program for newly immigrated high school students which is fascinating. Wow. Uh, this is yes. a high school senior? High school senior you're talking about now? High school senior, yes. Wow. Um, and she essentially had this idea that 
you know, newly immigrated students, you know, have several bar barriers to overcome or hurdles that they need to overcome because they're coming to a country where they may not speak the language and they may, so may also not understand the culture, particularly the culture of high school, which can be, you know, a very interesting time in your life. <laughs> I'll just say that. <laughs> Challenging for sure. Yeah. Challenging. For, even so, if we're from this same community, right? Even if we absolutely. grew up here. Yeah. My so, goodness. I love what she's done here is she's she's helped create this program where she pairs the the immigrant students with um, another high school student that is is from you know the United States and their job is to foster a relationship where that student if they need to can practice their English speaking skills and also can be there to help them you know through the the cultural competency challenge that they might experience coming into, you know, a, a, a totally new country. Um, and it's a really great way for them to connect with somebody that's their, you know, their own age and can really help them build a social network, which I think is really important for you as a high schooler. I know when I was there, it was very important that you had friends to lean on. Yes, my goodness, so, yes. And then the best thing about it is she piloted this program and then ultimately she raised money to make this a permanent program within the nonprofit. And now she's got volunteers, not just from her own high school, but from 25 different high schools here locally that are helping, you know, execute this program across the region. It's, it's remarkable. Uh, yeah. I, I can't remember much uh, in my high school, particularly my senior year, <laughs> that would anywhere come close to the kind of civic minded, community minded uh, and philanthropically minded aspect that, that she represents. So that is beautiful. And well, I guess, Robert, what do you think in terms of a nonprofit leader listening? What's the takeaway there, you know, as you see a or learn about a story like that one? Well, I mean, I think I think and this is going to sound this is going to sound awful, maybe not awful, but it's just going to sound, you know, we hear so much about the latest generation just not necessarily being willing to step up to the plate and do the work. Uh -huh. um, I think that's just because we don't understand how they want to do the work of helping our community. Um, I think that this, you know, the 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 younger generations, millennials and Gen Z, they're 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 really motivated by volunteering, getting their hands dirty, and this is just a really good example of how somebody is leveraging their skill to, you know, help those in need and building a program that they ultimately wanted to fund. Like you can't get much better than that. I mean, they built something programmatically and then they actually fundraised for it. I mean, that is impressive. And so I think we're selling these, these uh, you know, the younger generations a little short when we think, oh no, they're not gonna be, they're not doing what the work we want them to do in the community. Such a good point. And, and I guarantee everyone listening right now has someone like that in their community. Again, to me, the question is, yeah, what are you doing to engage these emerging leaders, these young philanthropists who do indeed want to roll up their sleeves. As you said earlier, you know, Robert, it, it, do you have volunteer opportunities? In Absolutely. fact, do you have internship opportunities at your nonprofit? Because yep. there are students like that one, both high school and college age, that likely would help you if you, in fact, provide the opportunity. You know, I, I've learned recently, Robert, that in more and more universities are developing programs around nonprofit and philanthropic leadership. There are over 300 now in the United mm -hmm. States. So so clearly this young generation does have um, motivation, um, but I guess we need to take advantage of that. Absolutely. No, I mean, I, I feel like they're highly civically minded um, and we just need to learn. We need to do a better job of learning what how to motivate them to get involved with us and really connecting with them on their level. Yeah, well put. And well, Robert, thank you for lifting up, frankly, these beautiful stories of philanthropy and community engagement. And we've just touched on three uh, within a, a larger award ceremony of eight uh, recipients, which all uh, have done wonderful things. And this is representative of not National Philanthropy Day events going on all over the country. So I know you and I both will encourage our listeners to get involved, uh, whether it's literally in these ceremonies or the spirit of these ceremonies. Uh, what can you do to bring that to your organization and to your community? Um, for all that, thank you, Robert. But let me ask you kind of a closing question. You know, you've had this conversation, I know, with lots of folks that are pondering nonprofit leadership. Your journey, to me, has lots of wonderful advice built in, but is there anything else you might add to someone who's listening right now saying, all right, 
I'm thinking about nonprofit, the nonprofit path, what would you say? Well, so, I mean, I, my first inclination is to always say, when in doubt, like volunteer, get involved and, and learn about, you know, the organization you might have interest in, whether you're wanting to work full time, part time, or just as a volunteer leader within the organization, it definitely helps to get connected in that way. Um, the other thing that I would say is if you do enter uh, the non the nonprofit sector, um, it never hurts to ask for advice. Um, our, our folks are always willing to help you if you have a question. We're always there to mentor. I mean, my story is, you know, a great example of that. I've had many people who have brought me along on this journey and I wouldn't be here without them. So never shy away from asking other people to help you um, and, you know, <laughs> providing you some opportunity to, to better yourself. And then I would say once you're in the sector, my biggest piece of advice is to, to tell you is to check your ego. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I've been doing this now for what, 15, 16, 17 years. And, you know, the thing I find is every day I learn something new from somebody. So never think that just because you've been doing it for a long time that you know everything because you know what, somebody's going to come along and is going to have a really good idea that you're going to miss out on because you weren't paying attention. Um, and to me, that's the biggest disservice that you can do because there are lots of great people here who have got great ideas and are willing to share them with you if you'll just listen. Wonderful advice. <laughs> Indeed, nonprofit leadership is a lifelong learning journey, is it not? Absolutely. And, and so thank you for reminding us. If you think you've arrived, you're wrong <laughs> because <laughs> the path will continue. And frankly, we need forward thinking leadership in our sector, as oh, you have done and you have represented it multiple organizations. So I'm glad you lift that up. Yeah, well, and I, I, I don't say that to be mean or anything. It's just, and it's not that I say that anybody does that. It's just one of those things. Like, I find myself saying to myself, you know, you you think you know everything, but you really don't because yeah. you know, yeah. there are there are others out there with with equally great ideas, and if not better ideas, and you just have to be willing to listen. Um, you don't know everything, and just because it's worked one way for you one time doesn't mean it'll work for you the same way the next time. So great reminder. Be adaptable. <laughs> yes, great reminder, as you have provided throughout this discussion. So for that, I am grateful. Of course, I have one parting gift request. As you know, it is coming, Robert. Uh, yes. I've got a book among the books that you have read. Is there one in particular you might lift up as a recommendation for our listeners? Yes, well, uh, I'm, I, I hope everybody has already read it. But for me, it was obviously one of those. It's a great book that was a great reminder to me that, you know, simple things can yield great results. And so my book recommendation is if you haven't checked it out, um, go pick up the Checklist Manifesto by Atul Galande and read it. Um, it's a great <laughs> reminder that this world is crazy. It's busy. Information is flying at you from all different angles. And the simple act of making a list and marking things off can aid you very well in your journey. I... Um, uh, if I had my video on, I would show you my list, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> my list is an ending list of bullet points and you strike through them whenever you get it done. Obviously you can achieve that digitally if you are so inclined. I've got those lists too, but you know, for me, it's just a great reminder that the simplest of things can be the best of tools for you. I could not agree more. And I'm delighted to lift that book up. I enjoyed it myself. Um, and you're right. Even those with expertise, I think uh, he gives examples, right? That when you fail to keep a checklist, uh, they're tragic examples in some cases of where it can hurt you. But maybe Absolutely. the more optimistic way to look at it is, hey, it'll just help you and help you uh, accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. So thanks for putting that on the list, Robert. A great addition to our book recommendation list that you have now provided. And of course, I'm sure our listeners want to know more about you or where where should people go to find out more about you and the great work you're doing at ASC? Well, I mean, obviously, you're welcome to vis visit um, all of the work that we're doing at ASC at artsandscience.org. And if you want to uh, keep up with what I'm doing, I'm not always the best contributor, but check me out on LinkedIn. I'm what? Uh, 
slash r touchstone I, I believe is my 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 handle <laughs> hey we'll make it easy uh, just go to the show notes for this episode and we will make sure robert your linkedin is linked up uh, as well as links to asc and afp in particular where you have made wonderful contributions so for all of that and especially for joining me on this episode i appreciate your being with me on the path no, I am so glad to be here. It was great having the conversation with you, Patton, and I really appreciate all the work that you are doing to develop wonderful fundraising leaders and nonprofit leaders. Um, you are a true testament to great work, and thank you for everything that you do. Well, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Robert as much as I did and came away with some practical ideas that can guide your leadership journey and help you celebrate philanthropy that's taking place right now in your organization and in your community. Don't forget about the show notes uh, for this episode, number 183. Just go to the website, PattonMcDowell.com, and you can find out more about Robert, about the Arts and Science Council, about National Philanthropy Day, and a link to the award winners we discussed. There's some great stories there, and you may well want to learn more. As always, thanks for sharing this episode with someone else on the path. And if you haven't already, you can subscribe to this podcast. Just go to the podcast page at PattonMcDowell.com and you will see the follow button. And if you like this episode, make sure you click on the episodes button also on that podcast page. And you can scroll through thumbnails of all of our episodes, uh, or you can search by topic or even guest name. Thanks again for all you're doing for this nonprofit sector, especially right now. Keep up the good work for causes that are most meaningful to you, and I'll keep bringing you content that can help you do it even better. Have a great week. I'll see you next time on The Path.